Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first Technology in Action Theatre session of the day. Um, this is a panel discussion, uh, and it's talking about where things have gone in the last year in terms of industry, industry support for IP interoperability. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First of all, we've got Brad Gilmer, who is Executive Director of the ANWA. We have Felix Poulain, who is a topic leader on live and IP production for the EBU. And we also have Thomas Edwards, who is a VP of Engineering and Development for Fox. Uh, unfortunately, we were supposed to have a couple of other uh, people here today who couldn't make it, so just to mention who, who they are. Howard Luck, who's Director of Engineering and Standards for SMPTE, couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, and nor could Mike Cronk, who is Chairman of the Board and Vice President of Core Technology for AIMS. Anyway, I'm going to hand you over to Brad, and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome to IBC. Thank you all for uh, coming to this, our first uh, event here at the theater. And I was going to stand up there, but I think maybe it would work better if we just have a conversation here. And also, uh, Tom, when we get to that point a little later, if people have questions, they're more than welcome to ask those. Um, a lot of people are very aware that the industry is in a transition period between traditional SDI infrastructure and uh, IP technology. And in my role as executive director of the AMWA and executive director of the Video Services Forum, um, really in the summer, a little before the summertime after I, uh, NAB, things were looking pretty rough, uh, frankly, uh, from an a end-user perspective. My background was I was the head of engineering and operations at Turner Broadcasting in the United States, uh, responsible worldwide for our television networks. And my staff always dealt with what I call the loading dock problem, which was where vendors would deliver equipment that you'd ordered to our loading dock, and then it was our problem, our staff's problem, to figure out how to make all of those work together. And I see some people smiling in the audience. You may have experienced this yourself. Um, and as we move to an IP infrastructure, there, it really, during the summertime, was looking potentially like there could be big problems for us. Um, just speaking quite bluntly, there were groups within the VSF and the AMWA manufacturers that were working together to try and come to a universal way to handle professional media in the IP space. There was a great effort uh, within the Joint Task Force on Networked Media, and we'll be talking, I'm sure, some about that later, toward uh, bringing a number of different standards together. But speaking bluntly, uh, there were companies like Everts uh, and efforts like Aspen that had their own kind of approach to IP, and Sony had their own approach to IP. And uh, those two companies and potentially other fractionalization uh, of fundamental ideas about how to go about IP looked like we were headed for another classic VHS, Betamax, <laughs> or pick your, pick your format, um, format war. Um, and speaking as someone who owned the loading dock problem for Turner Broadcasting for a number of years, that did not look good. Uh, and added to that was another dynamic that really was problematic, and that is that Google, Netflix, they don't have the loading dock problem. They don't have facilities with traditional SDI equipment, millions and millions of dollars of SDI equipment. And if uh, a Google has a particular video problem that they need to solve, they go put 60 or 80 engineers on it. They invent a technology and an API, and they say, this is what we're going to do, and off they go. But traditional broadcasters are not in that world. We have existing infrastructure. We need to transition to IP, and the things that we do require multiple vendors to support the breadth and scope of our activities. And so we cannot sit around and have another very disruptive format war that takes two years or more, let's say, for the industry to kind of figure this out. Because if, as broadcasters, we cannot deliver products that people can consume 
on whatever devices they want to watch them on, other in newcomers to the, to the television industry are going to blow right past us. So I personally, uh, as an ex-Turner person, um, was very concerned about that. I've talked with a number of other colleagues in the industry, a um, couple of them who are up here. Um, and I was quite concerned about that. So I, I think the, the question is, that didn't happen. Already you can see in, in Hall 8, there's a future uh, demonstration on IP um, connectivity, demonstrating interoperability between all kinds of vendors, including the Sony and Eberts that I mentioned. So guys, why didn't that format war <laughs> happen? We, e either one of you, which, uh, whoever wants to contribute. Why, why want to go, I'd like to I'd like, thank you. I'd like to go back to first principles. Why do we care about IP? IP is cool, but that's not why we care about IP. IP might get us onto commercially available off the shelf devices, but frankly, that's also not why Fox cares most about IP. Fox is most interested in a future where we have a highly flexible and agile broadcast plant, one whose functionality is software-based and virtualized so that we can do everything we need to do in this incredibly uh, complex media landscape that we're evolving into. You know, we used to be mainly a television network uh, over the air. We used to be cable network. Now we're doing all kinds of VOD distributions, internet, there will be all kinds of new things we haven't even thought of yet. And that's why we care about IP, because IP is the on-ramp to the software-based virtualized video processing future. So I think it is important for vendors to see into the future and recognize the future is not in hardware anymore. The future is not going to be in a broadcast vendor stamping out pieces of metal and PC, uh, PC boards with coaxial cable connectors on the end. The future is going to be software engineers writing computer programs to do all of the mass control, play out, live production that we do today. And I think there was a recognition that to try to fight a, a war in the world of transporting video and other things like registration discovery is not the big problem. The big problem is turning around these great big battleships from a hardware past to a software future. And I'll say I do appreciate the fact that there were early, early adopters out there. You know, Everts and Sony were out there very early with IP systems. And, and they're, and they're doing a great job, yeah. Do I'm sorry. Uh, and they were, they were out there. Well, and we'll probably make this more conversational anyway, just so yeah. you know. Um, and they were out there because they had customers who were requesting that. It's not necessarily that they were trying to be disruptive. Yeah. They had people who wanted to buy equipment that worked now yeah, and because we're, of the demand. Yeah, and so we're, we're making sports every single weekend. Fox Sports has an OB truck out there with a 10 gigabit Ethernet switch that's, that's making video with a proprietary format for right now. But we made sure within our contracts that we said, as the standards evolved, you have to evolve your product to meet the standard. And the good news is if it's an FPGA device, you just download new FPGA code, you can convert from a proprietary format to a standard format. And we're going to hold our vendors accountable to make sure that they implement these standards. And I think that's part of the reason why you see all these companies have joined the Alliance for Interoperable Media Systems. They're, they've got other customers besides us who are applying the same kind of pressure. Sure. Felix, uh, why didn't we end up in a in a war, and if we didn't, and people are all working together, do you want to talk about the roadmap and what the vision is for that and what people are rallying around? Yeah, yeah. When you were explaining, um, I mean, a year ago, just think after the IBC last year, the, the impression of this diversity of options and we're not going to make it. There was a, a kind of a moment of, 
of, of stress about will we make it, there's too many choice. And I think the last year, because we knew it was what was going uh, in the back, so in the background, so the standardization effort, what was going on, but w it was not clear. In one year, I think we achieved to kind of bring a lot of people together because there's a common understanding that we, we need to fix that uh, common format. So uh, JTNM, for instance, this discussion started not yesterday. We started that in 2013, that That's meeting right. in Atlanta, uh, totally open. We knew there was something happening. It was really not clear what was going to be the end result of that. We started to talk about how do we imagine that environment? What are the concepts? What are the models? What are the frameworks? We developed this reference architectures. It was very abstract discussion, but trying to identify what's really need in order to achieve interoperable system at the end. And um, in the meantime, there was implementation of that reference architecture into standards, into specification. But a num number of them from many different organizations, and that left, I think, an impression of many different options. But actually, when we did, and that was the, the uh, effort of the, of the last year, the effort to try to understand how all those different components that are all needed to achieve the full system work together, we realize that actually we are in an evolutionary environment. Uh, we're trying to do much more than just SDI here. We're trying, SDI is transport of video in a directional from one point to one other. Now we're trying to, of course, do that, but we try to get to that flexibility point that IP technology can provide. And this requires a lot more building blocks to achieve that. So the, the roadmap, the JTNM roadmap, is just how those building blocks will happen over time. And the feature will be added to the, the core feature, the core functionality of video and audio transport. Of course, the timing of it and discovery of it. But also, we need uh, uh, to control our network. We need to, uh, to achieve virtualization, ultimately. So there's a lot more to be done, but nothing prevent us to move on because there's a clear roadmap of how those technology will build a system at the end. So. Can, can we maybe identify the cast of characters? Yeah. Who, who is the VSF? Yeah, so the Video Services Forum, the VSF, is a trade association, and it developed the 2022 set of SMPTE standards initially and then submitted those to the SMPTE. And those... Um, have become the, the primary video transport standards for IP from remote facilities. Let's say you have a sporting event here in Amsterdam that needs to go back to a, a broadcaster in Germany. Transport, primarily it's intended to backhaul in the United States, we would say that, that signal from a stadium back to Germany where then a broadcaster would use it and distribute it. Um, the AMWA, the Advanced Media Workflow Association, works a lot on software specifications. It's also a trade association developing um, kind of the top layer a application specifications, APIs. Um, we've got the AES involved with this effort. and The Audio Engineering Society. Audio yes. Engineering Society, obviously. They're these due process standards body compared to the VSF and the AMWA that are trade associations. We've got the SMPTE. Right, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Absolutely. The standards development organization of record for professional uh, broadcast video. That's right. And then uh, here at the show over at the IP demonstration, you'll see a couple of other names. One of them is Ames and uh, the Alliance for Interoperable thank you. I'm glad media, you knew that. <laughs> media Solutions, yes. And Ames is primarily involved in marketing these uh, products to the industry, the concepts. But I'll say also, Ames develops its own roadmap. And again, Ames yes. is primarily an organization of vendors. There are some users like, like Fox and NBC who are, uh, who are members. Uh, but they developed their own roadmap of how these different standards should be deployed within the industry. And they all agree that these, this is the roadmap that, that they're going to follow. Absolutely. And then the last one I would mention is the IABM. 
who I think uh, a number of you know as well, and they also are helping to uh, promulgate these specification and standards and the roadmap, the general approach into the industry. And the, the what's the JTN? Yeah. Well, and then we've got this other organization <laughs> yeah. with three letters down yeah. here, the EBU. Uh, the EBU yeah. too, the European yes. Broadcasting Union. Okay, right. Thomas. Felix uh, represents. <laughs> and the JTNM, can you explain what the, yeah. the JTNM so the, is? So the Joint Task Force on Network Media uh, is the collaboration really of VSF, AMWA, uh, SMPT, and EBU. Um, and it's just a platform for coordinating all of our, our activities and developing that vision and roadmap for, the, for the, the future and the present even. And so that coordination role turns out to be critical. And you mentioned coming away from IBC a little concerned last IBC and I'm, uh, I think I shared that concern as well. And I, I think as people sit here and they hear all these different organizations listed, you may think, oh my gosh, there's all, again, once again, if not a format war, well, there are an awful lot of people and organizations involved in this. And, you know, are they all doing the same sort of things and or stepping on each other's toes or whatever? Uh, you mentioned the role of coordination within the JTNM, and that's been critical. Um, and uh, again, I would come back to the JTNM, uh, but talk about uh, the reference architecture. When we first started looking at this transition to IP, the fact is that a group of us got together. We knew that we needed some coordination around how to approach the transition to IP, but we, we admitted we really didn't know what we were gonna do. What would be useful output to the industry? One of the outputs that w the JTNM has produced that already has borne fruit is the reference architecture. And what a reference architecture is, is it's a collection of best practices, specifications, standards that help us as an industry focus down out of all the many possible ways we could do professional video over IP or professional media over IP, Let's focus down on these standards. And Thomas, you were really helpful in a lot of that discussion and helping us winnow out things and come to a particular agreement. Let's focus on these best practices. And so there were a few things that were published in that reference architecture that turned out to be extremely critical. And any time the industry is working to achieve a united approach, there's a tension and that tension is, if everyone is doing everything the same way, then how do manufacturers differentiate themselves? What is the benefit of going out to find the most talented people, the best technologies, and apply those to professional media when the industry has agreed everyone's going to do the same thing? So the answer to that is that without coordination, we end up with chaos. And Netflix and Google and these other upstart companies are just going to put us out of business. Well, I'll, say, I'll say also... But, if, if, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, if, if you've heard of the concept of network effect, that the value of a network rises with the square of the nodes, not just linearly, but, but uh, ge you know, geometrically, uh, it, the truth also holds for devices inside our broadcast plants. If I'm limited to only purchasing devices from one company, I, I can't get my business done. I have to have best of breed of all of the devices in my plant. I have to have vendor A here and vendor B there and vendor D there and vendor E there. And sometimes maybe they're not even competitors. One makes cameras and one makes switchers and one makes video servers. And th you know, they have to talk together. If they can't talk together, the value of the network is incredibly depressed. And this isn't just an issue for users. This means users will be buying less equipment from vendors as well. So it's in the vendor's best interest to make sure that there are common standards so they can get the value of the network effects as well as their users. Absolutely, absolutely. So what I was saying is that if, if the if there's just a wild west, as we say in the States, 
if you just go out and everybody does their own thing with IP and you know the great thing about IP standards is there are so many of them you can pick anything you want right then we have the problem that you said as implementers we have a very devalued overall market on the other hand if we tell everybody how to do everything it's very regimented and no one can innovate the obvious solution is to find the point in the middle right and so within the JTNM we identified some critical fundamental frameworks that must be in place if we're going to enable this industry in an IP environment. And then the idea is on top of a common way of doing these fundamental things, people can innovate and do their best work. And so those fundamental frameworks are identity, timing, and discovery and registration. Um, and uh, transport uh, is, a, is another key point. And if we get those fundamental approaches to those things the right way and as a common approach, then people can build all kinds of stuff on top of that. So I don't know if you guys have anything you wanted to add on about the fundamental frameworks or the, the reference architecture. Well, I'll say that things like discovery and registration is very exciting because this is capability beyond what we have with SDI. In other words, if I plug a camera into a video router, I don't know anything about that camera. You know, with this discovery and registration that's provided by the AMWA NMOS, I can now know, you know, the IP address of the camera, the uh, flow that's going to be coming out of that camera. There could even be metadata transferred about this is a camera on stage A. Um, the, you know, there's pan, tilt, zoom information that can now be discovered and found. Uh, it really it takes the power of IT and brings it to media. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is, by, by doing, wanting to do more than, than SDI, I mean, all the complexity now, a cable is, is many signal going in any direction. Uh, there's a complexity hidden there, and, and we need a lot of technology just to bring back the kind of usability we're used to. So the discovery is the fundamental building block for that. Absolutely.